for coming out to this afternoon. We've got a couple minutes before we get going, but I want to give you a, a little bit of some housekeeping and a heads up. First, thank you and congratulations. You have made it to the very last session of the conference, what we're calling the capstone session of the conference. So pat yourself on the back, give yourself a hand. You've heard speakers, our keynotes this morning, and the folks who are doing the sessions this afternoon, and you've heard folks sharing the work they've done, the ideas they've come up with, and I hope that you're going to leave today with some applications that you can actually do in your work, in the teaching that you do, in the support that you do. I want to make a promise to you for our time today. Before I get to all of that, I have to prove to my family back home that I am actually working. So everybody wave. There we go. Awesome. Thank you very much. The promise I want to make to you today is, and thank you, that you will leave our time in the next 45 minutes knowing how to do universal design for learning in your context with a five-step process. If you leave with nothing else than this five-step process, I promise you, you will have something that you can do in 20 minutes when you get back to your office or your campus, that you will have something you can do in two hours, and you'll have something you can do in two weeks and two months and two years, but we'll say that in the hands. So, by the way, if folks start filtering in at the last minute, when they sit down, just whisper quietly to them and tell them that they missed the most important stuff. <laughs> so I'd like to talk a little bit about removing barriers, universal design for learning, and your phone. Just a quick shout out. What are some words that come to mind when you think about universal design for learning? Words, ideas, concepts, just things. Accessibility. Accessibility. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll teach you a trick. Write it like this. A11Y. The 11 stands for the 11 characters in the word accessibility, and it marks you as an insider. Other people who are accessibility and UDL geeks will know that you're one of us. <laughs> what other words? come to mind when you think about universal design for learning. Just shut them out. Inclusion. Inclusion. Dynamic. Say it again. Dynamic. Dynamic. Opening doors. Open doors. Applicable. Applicability, cool. Opportunity. Opportunity. Multiple. Multiple. I'm not as good as Wordle, but we're going to do it. <laughs> Best practices. Mobility. Consistency. Consistency, yeah. Diversity. Diversity. Cool. We got a big list up here. Let me tell you a story to start us off. This is Katie. She was a student at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago, where I work. And Katie is the subject of uh, what could be a sad story. I work in our Center for Teaching and Learning, and a faculty member came to me one day and said, Tom, I have a student whom I know is cheating in my class, but I can't prove it. Help, I know you're uh, one of our experts on campus on academic integrity. And so I said, well, tell me what's going on. And the faculty member said, all right, so this Katie, she started my education course and she turned in papers that were really poorly written. They didn't really have thesis sentences, they didn't have details, evidence, and examples to help support her points. 
they kind of rambled. Sometimes she forgot midway through kind of what she was talking about. And they sometimes never really addressed the topics that I asked the students to work on in the first place. Now it's halfway through the semester and she's writing like a graduate student. <coughs> she's got all her ducks in a row. The logic is much better. And the professor showed me an early paper and a later paper from Katie. I looked at them and I came to the same conclusion. They sounded like two different people. And so the professor and I said, so what's the problem? Did you run this through Turnitin? Yes. Came back, 100% original work. No match. Well, what else did you do? The professor says, I tried Google. I tried asking all of my colleagues. Does this sound like some professional scholar that you know? Right? I even farmed this out and asked some of my colleagues at other institutions. No match, but I know she's cheating. This can't be her, it's two different people. And I thought, two different things. I thought, I will help this faculty member, the angel on my shoulder. The devil on my shoulder thought, if you figure out how this student is cheating, it will be a conference paper and an article publication. Because <laughs> this is obviously a new thing that all our methods for catching cheaters aren't catching. So what's the first thing that I did? I called Katie. I said, in an open fashion, hi Katie, my name is Tom. I work with faculty members to help them with their teaching here at the university. And I know you're taking a course from Professor X. Could you tell me a little bit about how you write your papers? Leave the door open. Give the student enough rope to hang herself with, right? Katie told me a very different story. She'd wanted to teach elementary social studies since she was a little kid. She was so enamored of history. She loved the idea of telling stories, learning from the past, names, dates, places, all those things. When she got into college, however, she found that oftentimes she was slipping. In fact, she was on academic probation in all of her courses. She was that far away from getting kicked out of the university. And she told me the story about how one day in tears after her professor had told her, maybe you're not cut out for college, that she had desperately called the main number at the campus and said, is there anybody who can help me with writing papers? And our folks at the switchboard connected her to our people in the Learning Support Center, also our writing center. Now, my colleagues at the Learning Support Center are not diagnosticians, they're not trained psychologists, they're not medical professionals in any fashion. They know how to help people with math papers and history papers and English papers. When they talked with Katie, they learned that when they were talking with her, she could articulate what she wanted to say. She could say it out loud. And then when they said, here Katie, take this piece of paper and this legal pad. Here, Katie, take this keyboard and type out what you want to say. The things in Katie's brain didn't come out her fingers in the way that she wanted them to do. So our folks in the Learning Support Center said, well, try this. They put a headset and a microphone on her, spent an hour with her training, dragging naturally speaking, the software that allows you to speak, and then the words come out in the application you're using. And then, suddenly, Katie sounded like so I was able to go back to the professor and say, hey, Professor X, this isn't what you thought it was. Now, postscript to the story. I said Katie was a student with us. That's because she graduated three years ago, and she's now a fifth grade social studies teacher in the Schaumburg School District outside of Chicago. Success story. Hooray, Katie. Right? Inspiring story. And I got a bad feeling about this. <laughs> I just fooled you. That was the way you thought I was going to start this presentation and workshop. I told you a story about someone with a disability. It was heartwarming. It had a happy ending. <laughs> right? We all kind of shed a little tear. It's like, oh, yes, Katie, this is inspiring. Right? Now, if that's all we do in terms of accessibility, if that's all we say is here are people with disabilities, here's how we can help them, 
how many faculty members, what percentage of faculty members in North America who've received training kind of just like this, what percentage of them have adopted universal design for learning? Take a guess. 20% I hear, 20 I hear, 10%. 2. 2% I hear, 2%. We have 20, 20 going at the high level, right here we have all the No. It is actually, and Kristen is dead on, 10%. That's not a lot of people. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to share with you two radical thoughts. First is in the title of the presentation today, Reach Everyone With Their Phone. So, how many of you folks have a smartphone, right? Okay, everybody, not a surprise in a crowd like this. How many of the students at your institutions have smartphones? Almost all of them. I work at a federally designated Hispanic serving institution. We serve some of the poorest and neediest students in the Chicago area. And almost all of them have smartphones. In many cases, it's a choice for the family between buying a computer and buying a phone. They buy the phone. It's more useful. How are they getting access to their learning? Through their phones. So I'd like to take a trip back in time. If you haven't seen the new Star Wars movie, it's OK. There's no spoilers. I'm going to stay with the original three first ones here. But let me uh, ask a different question. How many of you folks teach courses right now? Bunches of Andrea, do you mind if I have a conversation with you? Sure. Okay, awesome. She says sure now. <laughs> okay. So uh, if I come to you and I'm a, a student and I say, oh, Professor Andrea, I have this piece of paper and I need time and a half on the test and I need the exam software to read the questions out loud to me and in case that fails, I need a human being sitting next to me just in case I need clarification or the, to read it as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, before I have the conversation with Andrea, let me have the conversation with all of you. How should Professor Andrea respond? Okay, absolutely. Okay, absolutely. Anything else I can do for you? I, that's customer service right there. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, I was going to suggest even, can you tell me a little bit about why? Yeah. Um, how, how can I actually work with you to make you successful? That's how Professor Andrea should be. I'll ask Professor Andrea first, and then open it up to everybody, but how do you actually feel? Not that you tell the student, but how do you actually feel I, when you get that request? I'd be a little overwhelmed. A little overwhelmed. Um, I would try to think of all the practices I'm great doing. So tests are open, they're untimed. So Am I already students? doing this, mm -hmm. if I hear you right? How else might Professor Andrea feel, or any professor who receives a request like that? Not my problem. Go speak with the disability people. Okay. How else might a professor feel in that situation? Some get annoyed. Annoyed? Like they don't have the support to do what they need yeah. to do. A little at sea or, or not supported. So I want to suggest to everybody that emotions matter a lot in the interactions that we have. And one of the things that helps to explain that 10% adoption rate so far, even though we've been talking about universal design for learning since 1975, when they, made the, uh, when they started filming the original Star Wars movie in the deserts in Tunisia, that's why the theme is here. One of the reasons for that low adoption rate is when we think about students coming to us and making special accommodation requests, the feelings can be kind of negative. I heard a lot of different words. There's another word that often comes up when we talk about those feelings. Freeze your anger. Right? I'm mad. I had done all my work before. And Professor Andrea, thank you for saying that. You know, you, she's running through. Did I do this? Do, had I made these things accessible before? This is extra work for me. And it's work that comes up surprise-wise. It's work that I hadn't planned to do. And it usually doesn't come before the first day of class. I have yet to meet a student who needs an accommodation who doesn't wait until the end of the second week of class. 
either because they forgot or because it's really hard to get that paperwork at some institutions. So. It's no different on the human in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. And we should listen to you. And what I mean by this is that if we are going to use universal design for learning, and I want to dive into it with you now, we should do it in two ways that are different from how you're used to hearing people talk about it. And this is where I want to give you those things that you can bring back to your campus, bring back to your office, and use them in the next 20 minutes, 22 hours, 20 days. But first, I want to completely switch genres on you. We've done it twice already. You should be used to it by now. <laughs> How many of you folks have uh, ever read a book or seen a movie in the noir genre? So anybody tell me a little bit about noir? Yeah, what are some of the uh, film noir? So 1940s hard-boiled detective fiction. Right. Right? So what are some of the words that come up when we think about noir? So I heard dark. That's it? <laughs> Mystery. Ro Mystery. Roscoe. <laughs> Say it again. Roscoe. Sinister. Oh, it's with an E. I forgot. Yeah. Roscoe. Sinister. Or serious. Serious. Deadpan. Right. No, I said serious. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> oh, There's not, you can't even see across the bar, right? What other things are plot elements there? You've got dark, smoking. I'm going to put trench coat over here. Yeah. Suspense. Suspense. Tight head shots. Say it again. Tight head shots. <laughs> Close ups. The characters are very. Simple characters. Yeah. Rainy. Oh yeah, rain. Yeah. It's never sunny in a film noir novel, right? What other things do you think about when you're thinking about these movies and books? Very male-centered. If I wrote macho, would that be a right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, misogyny. <laughs> right. Uh, let's see. If I, if I wrote femme fatale over here, and the other side of that is uh, they don't call them ladies; they call them dames. Dames. <laughs> okay, you guys got it. So, in terms of uh, in terms of getting into that mindset, let me see if I've got it right. Boy, I hope this table holds me. Alright, so, my name's Roscoe. I'm a private eye. It's always dark and it's always rainy. I was in the office, I had the slats lowered, I wasn't expecting anybody except my friend Johnny Walker. <laughs> in walked this curvy lady, sorry, dame, <laughs> and I knew she was trouble right from the start. She said that her husband was dead. Everybody thought she had done it. Hell, I thought she had done it. But I took the case anyway, because she was trouble, and I can't resist trouble. <laughs> Simple enough character? OK, cool. So, you, so you're in the mindset, right? You're with me? All right. So let me introduce you to a completely fictional friend of mine. Those of you who are good at foreign languages will know how to pronounce his name. Read more books. Read more books, right. Reed teaches, guess what, <laughs> film noir and noir fiction at a uh, large university in the Midwest, which will go unnamed. And if anyone tells you that Reed is not a fictional character and is actually based on my real friend Mike, who does the same thing, they're lying. <laughs> fictional character, read more books, right? Reed teaches detective fiction. So he teaches all the stories that have these words in them. Oh man, I forgot smoking. Sorry, sorry, I'll do it next time. <laughs> and this is what Reed wants his students to do. And this is what we all want our students to do. We want our students to 
get engaged with the material that we teach. We want them to get so engrossed in the subject matter, whether it's personal genomics or history or data science or biology. And we want them to catch on fire with it, go home and go beyond what we're talking to them about in the classroom. We want them to get fired up about it. We want them to go do more research, learn on their own, start making connections to their other courses and their whole lives, right? That's what Reed wants his students to do. This is what his students actually end up doing. They, they cram in the reading, if they're reading it at all, on their Kindle, on the bus, on the way to work, finding time to study when they can. Now, none of you have this problem with your campuses, so uh, this is just a hypothetical, right? So Reed is trying to cast that film noir course for his mobile learners. He knows, he's asked his students, where, where do you do the reading? Oh, I do it on my Kindle, I do it on my phone, I do it on my laptop. Reed says, don't any of you use paper anymore? And they all go, no, 20th century. So, Reed has a nightmare. <laughs> he thinks he's going to have to be online 24 hours a day, chained to the keyboard so that when students post something to him at 11.52 p.m., he should respond by midnight or he's a bad professor. He thinks that he has to have a video chat open with everybody and a regular text chat and his email and the learning management system. And I don't know whether he's shopping for Speedos here or something, but uh, and a video thing and a this and a that and Snapchat and Twitter and all of those things. That can seem like the online nightmare. Thought we were done with Star Wars, right? <laughs> so when Princess Leia wanted to get the plans for the Death Star back to Obi-Wan Kenobi, how did she do it? She, programmed, she took a disc and she put it into R2-D2 and said, take this to Obi-Wan Kenobi, right? By the way, those of you who've seen the original films, um, how did they figure out that the plans were inside R2-D2? Do you remember? Yeah, it was an accident. You know, this is vital to the survival of the rebellion. It's like, oh, we found it by mistake. Right? So we actually have an advantage on Princess Leia. We don't have to send our messages by droid courier and hope that the droid gets across the galaxy quickly enough to the right planet and then accidentally, while it's being cleaned, spark the message up. In fact, we can put our messages into, I happen to have a droid right here. Right? And this is my point about universal design for learning. If we say universal design for learning is just for students with disabilities, or even if we don't say that, in many faculty members' minds, many colleagues' minds, it's just these small percentage of my students who I'm doing all this work for. So let's help Reed out. What one strategy could he adopt to supplement or even replace his face-to-face -face teaching? shout them out. What's one thing he could do in his film noir course or even in your courses that you teach? Make it personal for yourselves. Yeah, you could do voice over PowerPoint, record some of your lectures. Awesome. Have, discussions have the students watch films on their own time, flip the classroom so that they can come in and discuss. Um, have a discussion that takes place outside of real time, like with a discussion board in the learning management system. Oh my goodness, wait, I could, I could take the selfie camera and instead of taking pictures of myself and posting it to Facebook, which by the way shows you're a narcissist, um, <laughs> I could just turn that camera on and say, hi students, it's Professor Read More Books and I was thinking about you folks because I was watching this movie and I was looking at this scene. Awesome. And then it's not narcissism, it's just being a good professor. Darn right. <laughs> by the way, being a good professor involves a little bit of ham too, so. <laughs> So yeah, there's a lot of strategies that Reed could do to supplement his face-to-face -face teaching. Let's talk about universal design for learning. These are some covers of comic books from the 1940s and early 1950s. A lot of the details are a little small up here, and that's okay. I'll read off this one here in the bottom corner. This is Dan Taylor, Boy Detective, Battles the Vice Lords of Crime. 
And for those of you who were never 12-year-old boys, I have to explain something. This, is, this was the fantasy. Here we have 12-year-old Dan Taylor. Here's the police officer who's been shot. And Dan takes the police officer's guns, and he's returning fire to the mobsters. But he's also put the guy's hat on. Right, so he's playing the role, and here we have the curvy femme fatale sheltering against poor 12-year-old Dan. I have no idea what kind of pap they were, you know, putting out there for 12-year-old kids in the 1940s and 50s. But, you know, you talk about the internet generation, the screencasters today, and the screenagers today being kind of lost. It was just a different medium back then, right? But... What I have these comic book covers up here for is to talk about universal design for learning in a way that builds on what you heard from our keynote speakers this morning. Our keynote speakers this morning talked about multiple ways of keeping people engaged, multiple ways of demonstrating skills for your students, and multiple ways of giving them information. I want to make that even simpler because we're talking about reaching out to people on their mobile phones. If you think about all the things that you do in your course, you could come up with a list of 172 things you would need to do in order to make it fully UDL compliant. And you would then despair, right? Or if your policy is different from mine, you would go into your desk drawer and get out the bottle of scotch. They don't let me do that at my institution. All I want you to remember is universal design for learning just means plus one. It's all you need to know. If you have a text-based set of lecture documents that you've posted up into Blackboard or your learning management system, give that same kind of information in one other way. Whether that's an audio podcast, whether that's turning the selfie camera on yourself and doing a video, one other way. We talked about engagement, representing information and action choices. So how do you keep your students on track when do you always say in your course, attaboy, way to go, good work, keep it up? Or you give people ideas about how they regulate their own time. By now, you should have finished about 40% of your two-week project. Give that in more than one way. And sometimes that more than one way can just be more than one time as well. Action choices. This is the part where, where people sometimes don't do it, but we know how. And I want to get into that in a couple of seconds, so I'm going to table that. Here's the hold on a minute moment. We're at a conference on accessibility. We've heard lots of people talk about serving students who have disabilities. And I have to be delicate when I make a claim like, let's not focus on people with disabilities, because people who are advocates for people with disabilities would kill me. Right? These are fights that are nowhere near being done yet. Think back to the 1990s, early 90s. We have people on crutches, in wheelchairs, with mobility issues, with canes, standing outside of public libraries, city halls, and other public buildings with signs picketed saying, your stairs won't let me in. Fast forward to today. And now, most buildings, by code, have to have a level entry. There are curb cuts at every intersection. If you're moving from one house to another and you're moving into a, a building that was constructed after 1991, you will be able to fit the couch through the door. Why? Because that door can also accommodate a wheelchair. If you are pushing a stroller or riding a bicycle, you will be able to get up onto the sidewalk with no problem. Why? Because those curb cuts were there originally to accommodate people with disabilities. So that's a fight that's just about won, and it was started by disability advocates. For learning, though, this fight is nowhere near over. So I don't want to say, let's ignore the people with disabilities, but let's make a case for ourselves and to our colleagues that using UDL, A, it's a lot of work. B, if you adopt that plus one mentality, then it becomes work that you do in stages, in cycles, a little bit at a time. It's manageable. And C, it's work that benefits all students. So, you know, yes, it benefits people with disabilities, but remember the exercise we did to start ourselves off. 
there are a lot of negative emotions that go along just with the term accessibility, with the term accommodation, with the term universal design for learning. So I want to suggest that UDL is just access. That's all it is, access. For everybody, for any reason, no matter what. Here we have a student looking at his phone, studying after a late night at the library, looking up one more thing because the library is closed and he can still get into the databases. I talked to Sam Johnston. She's a research scientist at CAST. By the way, you heard uh, our keynotes this morning talking about CAST. It stands for uh, Center for Applied Special Technologies. And Sam is one of their research scientists who's actually done the scientific work to prove that UDL actually does increase the things your provost wants you to do. Student satisfaction, student retention, student persistence. Retention meaning the people who start your program will get degrees. Persistence meaning the students who are there on day one will be there to take the final exam. So Sam talks about wanting a situation that's good for everybody, thinking about what we have to do at the level of design that makes accommodation less necessary. We talked earlier today about the difference between design and accommodation. Accommodation is when you have one specific student, the Professor Andrea conversation, here's a piece of paper, I have a need, and you respond to that one student at the moment of need. Design, you do the work ahead of time, and you reduce significantly the number of people who come to you with that piece of paper. So Reed wants to make a video for his course. In fact, yeah, I, you know, I want to take you on the road with me, and you say that question exactly when you said it, because you set this up perfectly. Here it is. Here are the things that you should leave with today. Before we get into these five strategies, mental exercise. Put your hand up when you have in mind a document or file that you use in your work that you want to mentally play around with today. It could be your syllabus, it could be training documents. Just have that in your head. Awesome. Keep that document in mind as we go through these five strategies. First strategy is the no-brainer and you're already doing it. Start with text. Why is this so? Even if you want to do a little two-minute video with your selfie camera, or you want to create a podcast or a narrated PowerPoint presentation. By the way, I have to take a moment and talk to you very seriously. I have to actually go behind the podium because it makes me appear more important when I say it. Please help me to stamp out the scourge of narrated PowerPoint slides in higher <laughs> academics today. <laughs> I don't know how many times I've seen a PowerPoint slide in which there's just a plain background, some bullet points with text, and then the professor just reads the text. <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> where was I? Start with text. Even if you are creating something that is multimedia based, if you create a script for yourself or notes for yourself, even if those notes are not word for word what you will say or do, you have automatically made an alternative version ahead of time. The other nice thing is you can then make a lot of little things from the written thing. Most of us who are in support roles or teaching roles, we're good at starting with text. We write articles. We put together syllabi. We have lecture notes. We have study guides for students. These are great places to take something that already exists for you and mine them or ideas for making shorter multimedia pieces. The other fun thing about starting with text is that once you have the multimedia and you want to make changes, you can do that with text as well. Someone will mentally raise a hand. We haven't done it yet. Somebody here is thinking, I don't like starting with text. I like to just you know, put the camera on and wing it or turn on the audio recorder and wing it. Go ahead. This is not a hard and fast rule, but make the text version as well at the end. Whether you're a created in text first or created in multimedia first, 
I always say start with text because it seems to be a simpler process and you can get more pieces out of it. So that's why strategy one is, say it with me, start with text. Awesome. Strategy two, make alternatives. This one's the no-brainer that you might not be doing exactly this way. So let's take a look. Here we have a professor in a chemistry lab who is working on an article that she wrote about a new chemical process that she has developed. Here we have two student workers who are taking video of the professor in her lab working on the article about the process that she has developed. And here we have the student who is giving the thumbs up to our camera because they know that in addition to the video of the professor in her lab working on the article about the process that she has developed, they can also take that article and turn it into a text-based file to go along with the video. It's not exactly the same information, but it comes with. They can also take the video and pull still images from the video and do what I'm doing with you now. I'm not showing you video clips from Star Wars. I've got still clips with some audio over it. Your students will remember the information better from still images with audio than they do with video and audio. Why? Fewer channels to compete against each other. So strategy one was? Start with text. All right, awesome. This one's make alternatives. Strategy three, let them do it their way. This is the multiple means of, of demonstrating learner's skill. And this is the one that uh, the other ones were usually good at. This one, maybe not so much. We haven't adopted it. How many of you ask your students to write papers? at all, of any kind. Quite a few, right? Um, Nicole, the, for example. Um, they have to write a final research paper about any particular topic pertaining to um, a topic that can impact development in a certain stage of lifespan development. OK, awesome. How long does that paper have to be? Um, it has to be anywhere between six to eight pages. Six to eight pages. How many students in a class do you teach at a time? On average, 45. OK. So by the time Professor Nicole gets to paper number 20 out of 25 papers, she is also regretting the no scotch in your desk drawer rule, right? So here's an advantage for us as professors. Now that final paper, Professor Nicole might say, it does have to be a Microsoft Word document, and it does have to be six to eight pages long. But for the draft work, could your students show you that they're making progress by reading through a bunch of articles and then turning the selfie camera on themselves and saying, hey, Professor Nicole, this is Tom. I'm researching this particular aspect of things. And let me tell you about three of the sources I found. Right? Where you can offer students choices, you should. Now, here's the way that you do that. Think of the places in your course where your students always have questions, always get things wrong on the exam, always have a difficulty or need things explained in a different way. Those are the places where if you give them more choice and autonomy, Dan Pink talks about the three motivators of people in the workplace, and it's true of our students too. They need purpose, they need mastery, and they need autonomy, a sense that they are in control of some part of their learning. Where you can give students those choices to do things their own way, offer them. Now, I teach English courses as well as a bunch of other different kinds of ed tech courses. And one of the things, for some reason in business writing, we still teach people how to make memos. You laugh, right? Because nobody sends memos anymore. But we still teach them. Inch margins, Times New Roman, 12 point font, double spaced, um, date to, from, subject, don't sign it, don't put a salutation, right? all that stuff. So for the finished product on that assignment, would a video do it? Can a student demonstrate using Times New Roman font double spaced in a video? No. Now, in the steps leading up to it? Yeah, so if the assignment itself is the format, you can't give students choice on format. But there are still ways that you can offer that formatting choice to them as well. Think about that document that you have in mind. What are you telling your students? What information are you giving them? And what are you asking your students to do? Or what are you asking your colleagues to do? 
So letting them do it their way. By the way, we've got some health educators in here, so this might be a gimme, but the effect of chocolate and cocoa flavonoids on plasma lipids and lipoproteins associated with cardiovascular disease, in plain English, means chocolate is good for your heart. Emily is earning it today. Look at this. This is awesome. Big two, they're small. Awesome. Strategy four, go step by step. Break up things into their smallest chunks you can figure out. We're recording these sessions. The session lasts for 45 minutes. Right? So if you wanted to go back and review what we talked about, you could do so. On average, of this 45 minutes that we spend together, if you were the typical undergraduate students, how much of it would you watch to review it? Six minutes, four minutes, Two is correct. 120 seconds. You've got 120 seconds to hook your viewers before they decide whether they want to turn it off or keep watching. In, if it's YouTube and it's cat videos, you've only got 10 seconds. <laughs> right? If you don't see a cat falling off a dresser in the first 10 seconds, move on to something else. But going step by step, giving this is twofold. Give students the steps that they need to self-regulate, to be able to say, oh, I should be here in this process at this time. Oh, I should have done this much work or done this much of the reading. Or here's the outline of the process that I'd like you to follow. Read first, then respond on the discussion forum. Um, Emily, you talked about people using discussion forums when we were talking earlier today. What's the one problem we have with discussion forums is people don't read before they speak, right? Ah, this. I want to tell you about what happened to me when I went on my vacation with my family in Florida. No, read the text and respond to that. Right? So giving students the process, watch the video, read the case study, then respond. Then read a scholarly article and watch another video, then do an activity. You heard one of our keynotes talking about that 10 and 2 principle. It really works well. So wait a minute. Um, strategy one was start with text, and then strategy two? Make alternatives, and three was yeah. do it their way, and this one is go step by step, and strategy five is set content free. What I mean by free is in two different ways. First, set content free from the clock. Imagine, if you will, that uh, Rick is teaching a course in media production. Right? Expertise for you? Yeah. Awesome. And he has a bunch of adult learners who have family and work responsibilities, like most of us, right? So you have your little video lecture snippets, and you have some interactions that you want your students to do. Only problem is, one of the Rick students is a single mom. She has to put the kids to bed by 10 o'clock. And she then, all she can do is read the, the book or, or whatnot, but it's a media studies course. There's video, there's lots of interactive stuff that she has to get in order to be able to study for class. Rick has put captions on his videos so that that student turns off the sound, turns on the captions, and she just found time for studying that she didn't <coughs> have in the rest of the day. She could do it in bed while nursing the baby. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> she could do it from wherever, whenever. And it's, and it's true. Now, that's not a student with a disability. That's a student with a challenge raising the kids, making sure that she's there for them, right? At the same time, doing captioning is not just for people with disabilities. Um, the students on your athletic teams, the football team, they're at an away game, they're on the bus heading to the other city, and they have really junky connection. I can't even get a cell phone signal here, <laughs> right? So they're going through one of these valleys and they don't have really good connection, but they can look at the text-based version of things and study on the bus. I lie. No sports team studies on the bus. But you get the idea, right? Also, set content free from the programs you created them in. If you have created a multimedia video, a podcast for audio, if you have created, if you have created a narrated PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> Your students have to have that particular program in order to play it. 
Now, this is changing, but for most people on their mobile phones, they don't have Microsoft Office. They might have a viewing program if they're lucky. They definitely don't have specialized software like Maple or SPSS for you accounting people. Right? And so all you have to do is on your screen, use the software that you normally use, but record it as a video and post that up onto Blackboard or onto your YouTube or media server. And that way, anyone with any device can follow along. The nice thing about that, you can caption it, which makes your video searchable. Oh, I want to remember where Professor Danielle talked about this particular concept. You can search the video now and go right to that second if you're a student. We talk about student persistence, retention, satisfaction. These are the things that move the needle. So strategy one was start with text. Two was make alternatives. Three, four. And five is set content free. Let's check in with Reed. Right? He did his video. He posted it up online. He put captions to it. His students are doing a little bit better. And he was able to do one thing. Remember I talked about think of the places in your course where your students always have trouble. Those are the three or four places where you should do UDL first. That's a this semester task. That's a do it now and see immediate results task. And that is a save me professor from having to ha answer the same question 700 times task. Because they will, right? They all goof up, make the same mistakes at the same place in the class. These are the places where you can do yourself a favor. It's worth the work. This is actually the hardest conversation I have with faculty members at my own institution is that I can't sugarcoat it. Universal Design for Learning does require effort. And most people think, ah, it's effort for just a couple of people. It's not. It's effort that pays you back. So it was start with text, make alternatives, let people demonstrate their skills in multiple ways, as long <coughs> as they, those multiple ways still meet the objectives of your assignment. You'll save yourself on your scotch and liquor bill. Break up tasks into their separate components, show the people the steps and make sure that the interactions that you're having with your students have access, excuse me, access availability anytime, anyplace. No more training be required. Already know you. Then we can eat. So you should take some praise from Yoda. You now have, think of that document that you talked thought about before we looked at the five steps. Can you apply some of those five steps to that document now? Yeah? All right, cool. That's just about all the time we have, but I want to share one more thing with you. I was at my local grocery store, and uh, I actually showed this image at a, a college in Daytona Beach, Florida, and people said, what's that mushy stuff on the ground? We all know what that is, right? <laughs> I didn't have to explain slush uh, to, right, to the folks here. And I was going into the, the grocery store, and I snapped a picture. And I tweeted, Dear Jewel Osco, it's the name of my grocery store, Dear at Jewel Osco, uncool. Anybody tell me what's wrong with the picture? Yeah, the, the cart return has been placed inside the disability parking spot. That's probably not what you want, right? So, power of Twitter. Five minutes later, I got a tweet back. Hey, at Thomas J. Tobin, you're right, it's not cool. We are calling the store manager right now. This will be fixed in the next 10 minutes. Awesome, power of social media. So on my way out, I snapped this photograph. They did move it, right where you could, in the spot with the lines, and the person in the disability spot can't open their door. <sighs> but it's absolutely true that, you know, sometimes when you want to make changes or see needs, it's not always real obvious. So think of those places in your courses where you have spots where students always have questions, always need explanation, always need repetition. You notice I'm good at that. And those are going to be the places where you can try some universal design for learning techniques. Those five things we talked about are good places to start. 
I wanted to make sure we had a lot of time left over at the end here. What are you going to take away from our session now? What are you going to apply? What do you want to know more about? If you have questions, but I'd really love to hear what's in your head that you want to leave here and do. One of those things can be eat more Garrett's popcorn. We have a bunch. Um, I, I love the idea of just other takeaways do you have? I'll load up. <laughs> Shift the context in which the student responds to your material. Uh, for <coughs> example, have them learn what case history is and have them read literature as though it's case history and then solve the problem on their own in the story. Nice. And you can ask them to do that in many different many fashions. Different fashions. Awesome. Joe, nicely done. <laughs> Fantastic. What other takeaways do you folks have? I got popcorn to give away. Come and get it. I think I put the reminder to um, Jackie to show the process so that the, the, the it's weight binding for the learner. I don't remember the words you use, but talking, talking, I just want popcorn. No, I'm oh. just kidding. No, um, <laughs> So talking about um, so that they know by this time I should have, and I'm actually thinking of like a like a libguide, like a, mm -hmm. just a resource document, you know, static static sort of information, self serve kind of web page, but that we can still use that there too, like helping the learner. If we're talking about process or the, the, um, the research process, we should be thinking about a kind of wayfinding. And if you want to look up more research and scholarship on that particular process, the word that they use is called signposting. Yes, okay. Awesome. Yes, I've heard that so, word. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. thank you. Awesome. And she put her jacket on, but this is still new. I still remember. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's, well, that's a question to my mind. Um, uh -huh. How does this differ from a first semester student and a last semester bachelor student that you're trying to prepare the body for the working world and how much accommodation? How much you're not in? I'll just give you the popcorn now. Thank nice you. question. And the, the nice thing about universal design for learning is it's not a means of watering down or handholding. If you're giving everyone the same level of guidance, but you're giving multiple ways of the same guidance, multiple forms of the same guidance. So if you're teaching freshmen, you're going to have a lot more signposting in your course than if you're teaching. Uh, fourth year students who are about to go out into careers or graduate study. The same thing, it's not a way to water down the course or give the Cliff's Notes version of the content. So you wouldn't create a nice set of lecture notes for your students, but then have your video just be the highlights and then students will figure out really quickly, oh, I just watched the video, it's easier, it's shorter, and it's still the stuff that's on the test. So in terms of offering the same kind same level and same rigor of information. That's actually where doing the work of universal design for learning is the work. It's making sure that you're giving equivalent information. Now, in the other two parts of it, giving encouragement, keeping people on task, helping them self-regulate, that signposting is actually something I do with my graduate students, too. Just being able to say, here's the due date, and here's the process that you should go through. I'm not going to remind you again. Right? With your freshmen, you might be emailing them or texting them every three or four days saying, here's a deadline, here's something that's not required, but you should be doing it, keeping them on task. With my graduate students, I do give them that information, and I don't harp on it. So good question to ask, and, and a, a good addition to our conversation, because UDL is not a dumbing down, a watering down, a making easier. In fact, if anything, it is holding students to the same rigorous standards and allowing them to demonstrate that in many different ways. What other takeaways do you folks have? We've got a couple of minutes. I hadn't quite thought about um, phones not being accessible to certain types of software or certain types of, um, like you know, Microsoft Word. Mm -hmm. So I think 
making sure that you maybe put it in Google Docs or a way for people to always be able to access it on their phone they in fact, Google Docs is a really good example that I didn't bring up. I like that a lot because even if you're on a mobile device, Google Docs does the thinking on the back end, and as long as you've got a browser, you can gain access to files there. So my go-to example is YouTube or other uh, video sharing sites. So I'm stealing that. That's awesome. <laughs> and, and Chris, do you want to do Oh, popcorn's on. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Chris is looking at me like, where's my popcorn? <laughs> 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 Nicely done. Well, I was just thinking about this, not in terms of, like, I, I don't actually teach students, but mm -hmm. I support faculty. Yeah. So I'm trying to think about, can, can I do more of universal design in my support mechanism for faculty or instructors or staff who are trying to do something or request help or... Wait, 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 wait. Are you suggesting that... The Faculty members might benefit from GDL too. Yes. Of students. <laughs> <That's nice. laughs> awesome. Yeah, we are all learners at many stages of our careers, at many stages of, of our stuff. So that's a, a fantastic way that we can end today. I want to say thank you for being an engaged and enthusiastic audience at the end of the day, at the capstone process. Please take this stuff away. Do it. Share it with your colleagues. Spread the good word. I need you to be evangelists for this, and let's get that 10% up to more than that. So, thank you. Yeah.